and welcome to The Spectrum Show, the show dedicated to the Sinclair ZX Spectrum. Coming up in this episode, we go back to May 1985 to get all the latest Sinclair news and top-selling Spectrum games. We compare Spectrum clones for one of the all-time great arcade classics. We review some older games, we take a look at a newer title, and end the show in Type In Corner. But before we begin, the show is two years old this month. Wow, yeah, two years. To celebrate, I have put together an anniversary special, which should be up very shortly, if it isn't already there, so be sure to check it out. Right, it's back to May 1985. We all take spell checkers for granted now, but in 1985 they were a rarity, especially on home computers, where they practically didn't exist. Tasman, makers of the excellent Tasword word processor for various computers, have released a spell checking program that will allow users of its software to check and correct their spelling. A step in the right direction then for many small businesses that use home micros. After months of negotiation, Superman the game will finally be available for home computers. Beyond Software will release the game later in the year under its monolith label. The game is said to have cartoon-like graphics in an arcade-style setting and this could be the first of many games to be based on superheroes. Sinclair have admitted that production of its computers has been slow since December, as demand for its products has decreased. They are said to be disappointed, and even with a turnover of more than £100 million, they say they are looking for new ways to keep the cash flowing. They hope that the new flat screen TV will help, but as the 16-bit machines begin to appear, could the 8-bit micros be under threat? There are rumours that Sinclair are to launch a new, enhanced version of the Spectrum in the near future. The Spectrum 1 to 8 will feature 128K of bank switch memory and come in the same style keyboard as the Plus machine and the Costa QL. The machine will also have enhanced sound, but Sinclair are staying very tight-lipped about many specifications. As time marches on, technology never stands still, and there are hugely more powerful computers about to be released. Could this spell the end for Sinclair? Or do they have some secret project up their sleeves? Atari are to launch the Atari 520ST with a built-in 1MB disk drive and hundreds of colours displayed on a high-resolution monitor or TV screen. Game companies are sure to jump quickly, possibly even abandoning the 8-bit machines. The one thing that could hold off the exodus is the price. Atari are asking £699, much more than the Sinclair machine, but for how long? And that was the news, and now onto the top selling games. Coming into the charts this month include Gyron, the May strategy game from Firebird. Everyone's a Wally, the continuing saga of Wally Week from Microgen. Chucky Egg 2, the follow up to the platform game from ANF. Finders Keepers, the arcade adventure from Mastertronic. Death Star Interceptor, the Star Wars like game from Interceptor Software. And Gremlins, the adventure game, based on the film from Adventure International. Defender is one of the all-time great arcade games. Released in 1980 by Williams, the hectic pace, unique gameplay, iconic sounds and difficulty place this high in the list of favourites for many arcade players worldwide. The idea is simple. Save the planet from invading aliens who are set on abducting humans. Defend the humans, because once they're gone, all hell breaks loose and the game switches up a level, making survival almost impossible. Graphics-wise, the game was pretty simple. Horizontal scrolling wireframe landscape that you could fly through, and a mixture of different aliens to shoot. There was also a radar at the top of the screen, and the addition of smart bombs and hyperspace to get you out of tricky situations. On looks and gameplay, home conversion should have been easy, but many tried and failed to recreate the arcade feeling, mainly down to speed issues. 
on the Spectrum there were quite a few versions, so, excluding type-ins, which one was the best? This is Defender from Interstellar Software, later released by Dixons, but originally released in 1984. I remember this game coming out of the blue. The company wasn't well known, but when the game loaded it was a great version of the classic. Everything had been replicated and the scrolling and speed were fast and smooth. All of the arcade elements were present, from the landscapes to the alien types, and even the sound was nice, but we'll come on to that later. The radar was easy to read and accurate, and the complement of smart bombs were good. The player ship explosion, one of the best features of the arcade, is replicated very well too, although I did get to see this a little bit too often. The only bad thing I can say about this game is the sound. If you have a 48k machine, you'll be playing in silence. 1 to 8k owners, though, will get a better deal here with some nice effects. Control was via keyboard, interface 2 joystick, or Kempston, and all was excellent and responsive. The inertia of the ship was spot on, and really, this is going to take some beating. As you can see, I'm not the best Defender player, but I enjoyed this game, and my attention was on playing rather than dodgy graphics, jerky movement or poor game mechanics. This really was a joy to play. Next we have Astroplaner from Romic Software, released in 1984. The first thing you notice is the colour, not black as the arcade, but green. The next thing you notice is the ship. It looks terrible. In fact, most of the things in this game are very poor. The basics are there, I suppose, with aliens that kidnap humans and a kind of smooth scrolling landscape. But there's no radar, so it makes things a little bit tricky. There's also no smart bombs, so you have to rely on your laser for protection. There's also a slight twist in that you have to pick up the humans, or in the case of this game, mutants, and carry them to a factory, which was tricky to find because of the way the landscape was drawn. There's the usual aliens that attack you, and after a few seconds you will inevitably be destroyed by a fast-flying light blue projectile that seems to appear out of nowhere. Strangely, you can fly through the aliens, but not their lasers or bombs. The sound is very irritating as well. In fact, the whole thing annoys to the extent that you just want to turn it off and throw it in the bin. A terrible game. Next is Defendar, released by Microgen in 1984. Having played the Interstellar version, this one seems much worse than it actually is. All of the arcade elements are there, but the landscape scrolls in character squares, and the aliens also move in steps. This can be sometimes forgotten though with the hectic blasting that is accompanied by some nice sound effects. The aliens are all present, but all of the alien types appear on level 1, rather than introducing them at later levels. The firing isn't as pretty as the arcade game, or in fact the interstellar version, and can often seem to pass straight through aliens without killing them. Control is by keyboard only, and the keys are laid out sort of okay. Response is good, but the reverse just flipped the ship instantly, which can be a little confusing in mid-battle and can place you right next to an alien, meaning instant death. The player ship explosion is also a bit of a letdown, which seals an average attempt by Microgen that, although plays well, is not arcade perfect. Next we have Guardian 2, Revenge of the Mutants, released by High Tech Software in 1990. I was hoping that this, being released much later than the others, would prove a worthy contender, and I was right. The 
The keyboard layout takes a bit of getting used to, but once you're comfortable, the game just begins to flow. You can also play with a Kempston joystick, and having tried both, I'm not sure which I prefer. The landscape scrolls smoothly, and the aliens move really well, but they're smaller than previous versions, meaning the game is slightly harder. The inertia is just right too, and the reverse is probably the best implementation so far. Nice and smooth and easy to follow, making for a great gaming experience. Sound is good, but it's different on 48k and 128k machines. Oddly I prefer the 48k sounds, but the firing does get rather annoying after about 30 minutes. I think they were trying to emulate the deep throbbing pulse of the arcade by using low beeper tones, but somehow it didn't quite work. The player ship explosion is colourful and nice, as are the in-game explosions. The radar at the top of the screen is easy to read, and the whole thing just oozes quality. All of the alien types are thrown in at the start again, which is a bit of a shame, and the difficulty level is pretty tough, well at least it was for me. Overall then, another great conversion. This is Invasion of the Body Snatchers, released by Crystal Computing in 1983. Crystal made a brave move here when they released this game, because it had no sound at all, unless you owned a fuller sound box. The cost of that peripheral meant the vast majority of users could not afford it, and therefore the game would be silent. It was said that the decision was taken to allow the game to run at full speed, without tying the processor up generating sound. But whatever the reason, it was a gamble. The game certainly is fast, sometimes too fast. The landscape scrolls really smoothly and I had trouble trying to capture it, I presume because it's running at 50 frames a second. Playing in silence though really depreciates from the overall experience. See what you think. But via the marvels of emulation we can add the fuller sounds to see what it should have sounded like. The sound is not, in my opinion, as good as some of the other games that don't use the fuller sound box, so draw your own conclusions. <laughs> Graphics wise, the player ship looks more like a jet fighter than an arcade starfighter, but the rest of the game does look quite close. The colour scheme is a bit drab, and the radar at the top of the screen takes up the full width, but is easy to use. Control is by keyboard or fuller joystick, and is very crisp. It needs to be, considering the speed the game runs at. The player explosions is good, and again, I got to see a lot of that. Gameplay is close to the arcade. I just wish I was a better player. Now onto a very early game, probably the first Defender game on the Spectrum, Orbiter by Silversoft, released in 1982. Because it was one of the early games, it certainly shows it. There are different versions of this game too, some with sound during movement, others not. Which you prefer is down to your own preference. Having the sound while moving does slow the game down slightly, but does add to the game experience. Scrolling is character based and all the aliens suffer the same problem. Graphics are a bit basic, as is the sound. Gameplay is not too bad once you get into it. The control, which is keyboard only, is quite responsive too. The player explosion though is very poor. Your ship just wobbles about for a few seconds. The radar is also a tricky to read. If I had played this game first, I would have said it was a good game, but I didn't, and having seen what can be achieved by other software companies, this lowers the game's score. We do have to take into account though that this was the first Defender game, and released very early, in fact it was released before the machine was available to the public. The author wrote it all on paper, and entered the hex into the spectrum once he'd got it.
Anyway, moving on. And next we have a curious game, Rocket Command from Spectrum Games released in 1983. Spectrum Games went on to become Ocean Software, but this game didn't make it into Ocean Software's catalogue. And the reason? Well, if you look at this game, you will see straight away that it's a modified version of Orbiter. The graphics are slightly different, and the radar's been removed, but apart from that, everything's really familiar, even down to the keyboard layout. The sounds are the same, the movement's the same, the player explosion is the same, albeit with the different graphics, and I wonder what the story behind this is. I checked with the author of Orbiter, and he says he knows nothing about this game. Looking at the release dates, Orbiter was released first in around October 1982, and this game was released in January 1983, so it came out after the Silversoft version. So you can make your own mind up there, it's all a bit of a mystery. And moving on to another game which also has an Orbiter connection. This is Scuba Attack, released by Century Software in 1984. This game uses the same keyboard layout as both Defender and Rocket Command, and the whole thing is very familiar, especially when you're playing it. And the reason? Well, it was written by the same person that wrote Orbiter, Andy Glaster. I assume that this is an updated game engine, and to avoid any similarities, the scenario was moved underwater. Despite this, the game plays very well though, and as you can see, it's obviously a Defender variant. Instead of defending humans, you have to defend divers, and these drop down from the ship randomly. The aliens are replaced by giant jellyfish. The sound and graphics have been improved, but I can't help thinking I'm just playing an updated version of Orbiter. It certainly plays better than the original, but everything still moves in character jumps, although the action is fast and furious. Not a bad game then, but not one of the best. This is Star Blitz from Softec, released in 1984. This game had two versions on the cassette, one for normal Spectrum sound and the other for users of the Fuller Box. The one currently playing is using the Spectrum sound. We get some nice smooth graphics and large well-drawn sprites that look like the arcade game. The laser looks really nice too, and it's just a pity it doesn't make any sound. The inertia of the player ship is well done, and the player explosion is also nice, despite the underwhelming sound that accompanies it. Gameplay wise, it's a little easier than the arcade, which is a good thing for me, meaning I could enjoy some long games of alien blasting. The arcade elements are all there, with different alien types and human abductions. The scanner is easy to read, and the action is fast enough to be challenging. The only thing that lets it down is the sound, so what's the fuller version like? The game is the same as you would expect, but the fuller sounds are much better than the Spectrum ones. The laser now makes a sound when you fire, and there are some really nice spot effects. The player explosion is still a bit weak though, but overall this is a really good version of the game. And now on to our last game, Stop That There Alien by David Swan, released in 1984. This is a bit of a strange game, it's obviously written in basic and suffers all the usual effects of that. You can only move up and down, and you can't switch directions, there's no radar or smart bombs. This is just a poor game in every respect, but it's a bit of fun to end the tests on. So which Defender clone is best? I have to say, of all the shootouts I have done, this one threw up the best collection of clones. There are so many good ones here. 
so many really playable ones, and so many that are close to the arcade. Because of this, the good ones are all close together in every respect. So, the ones to choose from are Defender by Interstellar Software, Guardian 2, Invasion of the Body Snatchers, and Star Blitz. Invasion of the Body Snatchers has to lose points for not having sound on normal machines, as does the Interstellar version. So that leads us with just two, Guardian 2 and Star Blitz. Whichever the winner is, I'll let you decide. Mrs. Mott was released by Computer Solve in 1984, the company's only release. The game sees you playing Mrs. Mop in her kitchen with lots of work to do. Dirty glasses, laundry and rubbish start to appear all around her, and it's her job to clean it all up. To do this she has to collect a container to put them in, and when that's full, transfer them into their designated space. For example, the laundry has to be put into a basket, which then has to be emptied into the washing machine. The problem is, she can only carry one container at a time. To collect anything else, she has to drop that and pick up another container. The container cannot be emptied until you have enough items in it, and once you've achieved that, Mrs. Mop will start to flash. Ooh, er. Uh. At this point, you can empty the container into its final place. If Mrs. Mop does too much work, she starts to get tired, and this is indicated by a message at the top of the screen. To keep her going, she has to have a quick drink of wine, but drinking too much and she'll get drunk. At this point, the controls start to change, making things much more tricky. The game reminds me of Ultimate Play the Games Psst, but obviously with poorer graphics. As for the graphics, yes, they're basic, there's no animation, and it's sometimes hard to tell what the items are. The sound consists of beeps when items appear, and the tune when collected items are dropped into the correct place. Control is by keyboard or joystick, and it's sometimes far too fast, meaning you miss items. Level 1 just has two items to collect, cups for the sink and rubbish for the bin. As the levels increase, more items are added, and this is where things start to get tricky. Not only do you have to collect the items, but you have to make sure you don't get blocked in, because you can't move over the items themselves. You do have a magic spell, strangely enough, which allows you to clear one item out of the way if you do happen to get blocked in. But this is very rarely of any use. If you do get boxed in, you eventually become exhausted and the game ends, so it's important to keep moving all the time. It's not actually a bad game, but then again, it's not really good. Once you get the hang of the controls, it's easy enough to play, and can keep you happy for a few minutes, I suppose. Not a chart topper then, and if you look past the basic graphics, you just might enjoy it. This is 3D Star Strike. Released in 1984 by Real Time Software, this game fulfilled the player's requirements for a good Star Wars game on the spectrum. The arcade machine was a hit, and the home market was crying out for a conversion. This game features all the scenes from the arcade, and it's surprising that the lawyers didn't come calling. The first stage is in space, fighting off TIE fighters. It's important to shoot their missiles, as it is to shoot them. You have to protect your shields to get very far in this game. Once this level's complete, it's onto the surface of the Death Star, blasting away at towers. And again you have to watch out for the missiles. If you get onto level 2, you have to shoot the tops of the towers for extra bonus points. And the final stage is the trench scene. Dodging the structures, shooting the laser turrets and avoiding those missiles again. And then we get to the finale, and you have to shoot out two rotating pods that allow the battle station to be destroyed.
The vector graphics are fast and smooth and give a really good feeling of movement. Sound is great with laser fire and explosions. The game quickly became one of my favourites. It's easy to pick up and play and one of those games that you feel you've actually achieved something when you complete it. Control is very responsive, allowing keys or joystick to be used, and you can choose the difficulty right at the start, so the game never becomes frustrating. Obviously there's no music or speech like the arcade, but hey, this is a Spectrum. Apart from that though, this is an absolutely great game, as many Spectrum fans will already know. Tubaruba is the name given to you, a pesky kid always getting into trouble at school, and always annoying the teachers. This year, though, they have had enough. Your grades will be based on how much cash you can collect from the school, and if you've managed to collect £50, then you won't get expelled. Talk about bribery. So what we have here, then, is a platform game with a twist. After a very annoying tune, the game begins, and as most school kids have today, you're equipped with a jetpack. You can fly around avoiding things and trying to locate the money, which is scattered around in one pound lots. The first thing that strikes you when playing is the difficulty. This game is not easy, and too soon you'll find yourself dead. Also, it isn't clear what's dangerous and what should be collected or what should be left alone. You can shoot things too, which is recommended for anything that's moving. In fact, just shoot anything. It's like Jet Set Willy Cross with Jetpack and the difficulty turned up to 11. I struggled to get very far and often found myself dead for no reason I could work out. Very frustrating. The background graphics sometimes mask the killer sprites too and sometimes things can pass through walls to kill you. There are windows that when collided with will send you to another location. This often sent me to a place where I instantly got killed. Yet another frustration. The graphics are average but smooth, and control is responsive enough. The sound is adequate, apart from the awful tune at the beginning, and at least there's an option to turn off in-game music. Overall, I hate this game. It's too difficult, and I don't think the mix of gameplay actually improves the genre. Wouldn't to forget then, I think. There aren't many true role-playing games for the Spectrum, and certainly not very many that use the time-honoured format of the early Zelda or Ultima games. Released in 2013 by Retroworks, L'Azamour de Brunilda is a rare and beautiful thing, a perfectly formed and immersive role-playing game that does everything right. Upon arriving at the village you immediately get a weird feeling, and as you talk to people, you realise something is wrong. The game is very much story driven, which takes you into the game, and is something that so very few Spectrum games manage to do. The style will be familiar to anyone who has been around gaming, with a top down view of the area that can be investigated, things to examine and people to talk to. And it's important that you ask a lot of questions, because they will often reveal clues to you. It won't be long before you find yourself on your first quest, to locate a witch to help your friend recover from a mysterious illness. The graphics are well drawn and fit the game perfectly, and the music is good and sets out a nice atmosphere. I found myself wanting to explore more, to complete the quests and find out what was happening in this wonderful little world I'd stumbled into. The game will soak up a lot of your time if you allow it to. Just for this video review, I managed to get to chapter 2, and that was well over 30 minutes playing time. Previously I'd spent hours working my way through things as well, so it does drag you in. I can't rate this high enough, but realise that it's not to everyone's taste. So if you like this type of game, this is definitely top of the list, and probably one of the best games of its type for the Spectrum.
This month's game is Pinball by Stephen Bennett that appeared in an October 1983 issue of Popular Computing Weekly. The listing was tiny, which is probably why I typed it out. The game is a strange type of pinball, a kind of cross between pinball and breakout. There are randomly placed numbers on the table and a bat that you have to move using the 5 and 6 keys to stop the ball going out of play. As the ball hits the numbers, they are added to your score. It can be a little tricky to line up your bat, and it seems that there are some collision problems. But it's not actually bad to play. It certainly passes a few minutes, and it's an ideal candidate for modification. This is the type of game that you would pick apart to see how it worked, then add extra bits of your own. Considering the size of the listing, this isn't bad, and it's probably the first time it's been seen since it appeared in the magazine. It will be available on my blog to download very shortly, so go and have a play. Well, that's the end of this episode. I hope you enjoyed it, and thanks for watching. You can get in touch by using the details on screen. See you soon.